uh, Mr. Glenn Schaefer from uh, Structural T uh, Technologies. Okay, well, th thanks everybody for sticking around. I know these are the coveted end of the day time slots. And uh, like 30 minutes ago, I was thinking a beer would hit the spot right now. So I'm sure you guys are well ahead of me. But it's a, um, you know, it, it, it's an interesting topic. It, it's this, this session is much different than normal ACIs. No graphs, no equations, a lot of pictures. So it makes it kind of exciting. So what I want to talk about today is, is some new newer technologies that structural technologies uses to help in, in some of our work effort. And so I, I know that this is not intended, nor should it be. It's, it's not a commercial for structural technologies, but it does help frame why we went in the direction we did go with, with certain aspects of new technologies. So structural is a, is a um, Structural Technologies is an engineering and technology support group to Structural and Pullman, the contracting arms of our company. Those are by far the biggest arms. Technologies is relatively small. And one of the roles that Technologies uh, performs is performing condition assessments. But generally speaking, I, I say that in that our challenge is we're not a for-profit assessment service. I don't believe, I don't think we're like competing with WISH Jennies or SGHs. Our primary assessment opportunities come with partnering with clients that want to understand their problem better so we can help our operational teams um, develop a better solution that's more appropriate for certain repair strategies. So our goal really is to look at look at assessments or evaluations as a means to help our repair business. So to do that, we want to try to do it as inexpensively but efficiently as possible. We want to get the most we can without driving up the cost of doing an investigation to begin our repair process. So we do, like many others, we do numerous techniques of conventional type of assessments and evaluations hammer sounding as people have talked for delaminations, GPR to figure out where reinforcing steel is, what the cover depth might be, various other NDT methods like half cell potential for corrosion, when necessary core sampling to send materials out for laboratory testing, petrography, you name it. Nothing radically different than probably the other half a dozen presentations you saw before me. Um, they all add valuable information. They're great. We love them, uh, except they all have one thing in common, that you have to physically touch the structure to do most of these tests, which nine, you know, eight times out of ten isn't a real challenge or a problem, but, but two times out of ten it starts to become a problem. Working from grade, piece of cake. Hammer sound, walk around the structure, super easy to do, pretty efficient. When you start talking structures like this, though, when the only way to access them is rigging, expensive rigging of swing stages and that type of thing, it starts to get expensive. Now, there are certain many applications where that makes perfect sense. The cost is completely justified. But again, why I said who structural technologies is and what we do, a lot of our work is, is trying to help our operational, our operational side, our contracting side, develop a better solution. So if we can figure out a way to help them without escalating the cost, all the better for, for our company. So we, we try to do it that way. So, it you know, sort of brings up the touching part of concrete. It's great, a lot of ways to do it, but you're probably thinking this is a presentation on the topic on visual inspection. Visual inspection would fit perfectly in here, and it does. So difficult to access structures, or really any structures, have a large opportunity for a visual, visual inspection methods. Provides a wealth of information about the structures, whether that's spalls, cracks, stainings, uh, efflorescence, previous repairs, bug holes, initial original construction defects, those tend to all be very visually evident um, defects. So visual inspection fits in perfectly for these difficult to access structures, except we've got one bigger challenge, the same sort of challenge of it's difficult to access the structure, you need rigging, you need swing stages, you might need scaffolding, same thing kind of implies. It's Easy to see things from grade, a little more challenging to do it from existing platforms, other structures, et cetera. Even more challenging with scaffolding, even more challenging, et cetera. But you, you know, to see the top of these type of structures, you're going to need binoculars. You're physically not that close to it. So the opportunity to see things is there, 
The avoidance of some costs to do perhaps uh, special rigging is avoided, but you're still not that close to the structure. So you're kind of, you're seeing what's readily visible, but not necessarily all, the st all of the structure. So over the last few years, for at least our company, uh, three, four, five or so years, we've started to utilize unmanned aerial vehicle technology, which is, I guess, its official name. Most people would know it as a drone. Um, fits in for a number of reasons of, of what we're trying to accomplish. So obviously, as a company, I'm sure many companies, particularly us as a contracting company, we pride ourselves on safety. Swing stages are safe. Scaffolding, when proper protective equipment is used, is safe. But being physically on the ground is safer than being 10 feet off the ground. There's, there's no question about that. It tends to be faster to cover a large amount of surface area and elevated structures it tends to be a lot faster, which inevitably translates into lower costs. And it's comprehensive. By using a drone versus a guy standing on the ground with binoculars, we feel we can get pretty much 100% detailed visual coverage. And I'll grant you, it's, it's not tactile, so there's going to be certain defects that aren't visible. So we'll, we, um, we, we acknowledge that right up front in the type of work we do with clients when we're doing this, this type of project. But uh, we do get 100% visual, barring some occasionally obscured areas and things like that. So we really think it, it fits in trying to meet our, our, meeting our needs for, for what we're trying to accomplish for a comprehensive visual inspection. And over the last couple of years, we've gotten away from the term, ter, hmm, gotten away from the term drone survey, and are starting to call it more, or position it more as a, as a digital inspection, for a number of reasons. One, inevitably, the first couple of close to the mic. Inevitably, the first couple of times we we've talked to owners or uh, or yeah, primarily owners about a drone survey their brain starts to turn, we can see, see their gears starting to go, and they come up with something like, my neighbor's brother's nephew had a drone, and we had him come out here, and all we got was like 4,000 individual pictures that all kind of looked the same, and we really didn't find that that useful. So we, we try to position it a little bit differently and say, you know, it's not really a drone inspection. The deliverable's not necessarily exclusively a whole stack full of pictures. It's really a process similar to a traditional condition assessment. You're assessing information, you're gathering information, assessing it, doing measurements, quantifications, et cetera on that, managing that data, the good and the bad about whether it's drone technology or really any types of newer digital technologies, you're generating a lot of data that you need to do something with in an organized fashion. And then ultimately you need to report that data out to the client or for us internally. The best, the most important part though is it's not just a collection of information that gets regurgitated back out. The, these type of inspections in our world anyway are still managed by, interpreted by subject matter experts on concrete distress, chimneys, cooling towers, that type of work. So it, it's not just collecting information and spinning the bag out. There's still a lot of interpretation that can be done, which is exactly what a visual inspection is. Visual information interpreted by people that know what they're ultimately looking at. So one of the other things we found out when we started doing these for a couple of years, the first thing when you get on site that facility owner wants is a glamour shot of his facility. So he can put it in his brochure, his, his office wall, you name it. They always want a glamour shot, so that's a great, great way to suck up and get them off your back when you get on site. So do the glamour shot first, <laughs> then you know, pick a structure. And this is, this is random structure. Um, we're going to look at the cooling tower in the, this cooling tower down here. So obviously there's multiple steps in this or any type of process. So before our technicians would go on site, we'd plan out what we're trying to accomplish, look at our potential flight mapping, file paperwork with the FAA, all that precursor stuff that one might expect. But we get on site and essentially the first step is, the first step after the other preliminary steps is capturing the data. Uh, this is a, a mediocre quality rendering of a cooling tower. And you can see those little white dots that sort of circle the structure. Uh, those are actually individual camera positions that have a unique photograph associated with each one of those. So they are oriented north, south, east, west. They're oriented elevation-wise and 
tagged to individual pictures. So essentially, computer rendering behind the scenes combines those individual pictures into a 3D model, at which creates ultimately a rendering that looks something like this. Again, a little bit mediocre in quality, and I'll explain why in a second. Also, if I wasn't working off of a memory stick in somebody else's computer, this thing can twist and turn and, and zoom in and zoom out. Tends not to work so great on other people's computers at presentations like this, so it's a static image. And some people right off the bat, when I say, well, drones, that's really not that new of a technology, and I'll, I'll grant you that. But this technology is constantly getting new. This is a rendering of a series of photographs from perhaps 18 months ago. And this, this is typical quality. Different type of structure, but a chimney structure, this was rendering that was done about uh, two months ago. So that's the jump in quality in a little over a year in what can be done in processing time, alignment of individual photographs by the computer system. So it really is leaps and bounds amazingly progressing. So that's the type of thing we can do. So our subject matter experts can look at this structure or the cooling tower structure, rotate, zoom in, and essentially start to find defects, visually find defects. It would be great if there was some sort of artificial intelligence system that could tag those up front. That's probably eight months from now or so. But for right now, a subject matter expert looks at, looks, starts looking at the, that model, finds defects, and then essentially zooms into that model to start to see in greater detail type of defect, the quantity of the defect, the size of the defect, so our operational team then can start making appropriate estimates on repair quantities, complexity of, of removal of concrete, that type of thing. And this is, I mean, this is a typical, typical level of detail that can be achieved using commercial grade drone photography. Then the last step obviously is developing some sort of reporting for that customer. And we've, tr we've tried and are exploring various, various approaches. You know, a bound report that has defect after defect with exact locations, dimensions, type of defect we're observing. Obviously, all this information is now electronic. Is there a way we can present that data to them in a format they can use and manipulate without necessarily changing the data? And sort of everything in between. And, and we're working, working hard with our, our, our client base to better understand how this information can be best expressed to them. I think anybody that, that does ass assessments, whether they're visual, NDT, that, that's always one of the challenges. How to get a whole bunch of information that could easily be a 300-page report into something that someone can use and refer to when they want to see what their structure is like. One of the questions that always comes up is if we can do that for the outside of the cooling tower, what about the inside of the cooling tower? And the answer to that is it's mixed. But at the moment, there's some challenges with that. The drone in general needs to see five or six different GPS satellites to get its orientation, its stability, and to know where it is and what orientation it's taking pictures of. The further it gets down in that chimney, the less visibility it has to GPS satellites. So that's a challenge and it starts to mess up the process a little bit. There's also the two other kind of more pragmatic challenges. Inside of a cooling tower, it tends to be really dark. Outside is lit up by the sun and other things. So dark and covered with slime. So there's not a, often a whole lot of um, visual clues that lend itself to visual inspection of in, in the inside of a online cooling tower. So what I've sort of run through thus far is if somebody said, if one of, our, one of our contracting arms said, we're thinking about fixing this cooling tower, help us understand what the problem is, how much of a problem there is, and the quantities of material we might need to fix it. So that, that's kind of a standalone deliverable. But one of the other things we're finding is also that it, it can be used as a great precursor to a more traditional investigation. So for instance, if the structure, the owner feels it's important to do a traditional tactile investigation, but has, as everyone does, a somewhat limited budget. We can fly the drone relatively cheaply and determine if you're going to spend money on four swing stage drops, where's the best four places we can put that to get the most information we can to help analyze what's going on with this structure. 
Also, we can use it to quickly create some damage schematics. You can imagine being um, you know, up on a swing stage, hammer tapping, hammer sounding, and uh, trying to map out areas of distress. If you had a base map to start with, it was very accurate, and all you needed to do was perhaps make some notations, quantify something that maybe wasn't quite 100% clear visual, but you knew the damage kind of went out to a certain point. You've got a starting document already. It saves a lot of time in that data, physical data capturing while you're on site. And then finally, one of the other things that we were, I guess, a little bit surprised of is just safety issues. When the last, this picture down here is exactly what it might look like, one of our work crews was going in to start a repair process as we were go also going to do the assessment. And step number one is you have to rig. Uh, the drone was able to figure out the safety railing around that top of that uh, cooling tower was, was broken in spots, disconnected in spots. So rather than um, start the repair process, our first step was to recommend that they need to repair the railing before we could go up there. So that's cooling towers. Those are difficult to access. Chimneys are difficult to access. Buildings are a little bit easier, but have that same dilemma. A lot of surface area that is somewhat difficult to crawl over, or at the very least time consuming to crawl over. We find drones work pretty well for some of the facade work that we do, particularly in cities. And it might indeed not only be visual, Picture the drone or the better, more accurate, unmanned aerial vehicle. It's a platform, nothing more than that. A lot of times it carries a high resolution digital camera, it could carry a thermal camera, so you can see perhaps insulation problems, moisture problems in a, in a building facade. Same thing with a roof assessment. Leaky spots of roofs stand out really well just because of their, their heat retention properties. And then roof measurements. You know, one of the, we do, our company does roof repair, and one of the challenges of our subject matter expert on roofing has is a lot of these facilities have very poor, if any, drawings of their roofing system, and there's been new penetrations, piping's been moved over the years. So quite honestly, to start an assessment of where damage might be, they literally could waste a half a day creating the base map to map out where the defects might be. With a drone, you could create that map in CAD in 10 minutes. So a big time savings there as well. So I think in conclusion, we, we as a company find it's a great way to perform a visual inspection at a reasonable cost, getting 100% coverage really close. Nothing wrong with looking at things from the ground, but for a modest incremental cost increase, you can get really close pictures of the whole structure. Great as a standalone technique, and great as we're finding more and more, I think, to augment more traditional assessment means or to plan out traditional assessments. And as I, you saw in those two pictures of the cooling tower and the chimney, you know, if nothing else, while the drones may get a, bit, a little bit more sophisticated, the more intriguing part is how advanced, how quickly advancing some of the processing technology is coming along and what will I would envision in a year or two we'll be able to do with the, the 3D modeling aspect and really get a high resolution type of analysis more systematically. So with that, that's the presentation. I mean, anything, anything we can see that has a dimension, we can measure. So if, if you can see it, we can measure it. What is your, I mean, because certain drones can only get to certain uh, dimensional thickness. Yeah. I mean, like crack widths or something like that. Yeah, off the top of my head, I don't have the specific number, but I mean, we, we have different resolution cameras that we can man the drone with for certain different applications. But I know, generally speaking, the zoom ability of these drones are that if, if it physically shows up, on the image, it can be measured by, by technology. Yep. Was there any challenge at getting clearance to use drones? Yeah, I mean, there are. There, there, there's, the, there's the FAA aspects and all that. And quite frankly, of the, you know, and, and we haven't done thousands of these by any stretch, but we've had everything from owners say our, our 
power generating plant is private property, so you can do whatever you want. To others that have 80 million forms of insurance and liability releases and everything else and and everything in between. So I mean, it all it really depends on the on the facility of of how risk adverse or accepting of new technology they are. The problem tends to be even though there are utilities that are using it particularly for power transmission line flying a lot of them don't even if you say we want to do a drone do you have any special procedures they look at each other and say i guess we must incorporate somewhere but we're really not sure so yep. i'm not looking to get into this business but is is this a 3d um, mapping software is that off, something off the shelf or custom it's the base of it, we're working with a vendor that specializes in this, so the base of it was off the shelf, but it's, it's been surprising to me who you know, work, works in the department that, that, that does this kind of work. It's taken a much more customization than I would have guessed when we started it. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.